So feel free to hide if you don't want to be recorded. Okay. Oops. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Avash, for the introduction. I'm very happy to, to give this talk today. And uh, yeah, as uh, Abash said, I'm a PhD student at the Central European University, and I will give you today a talk entitled Distinguished Mechanisms of Social Contagion on Networks. First of all, I would like to show you these um, pictures. They all uh, describe a social behavior that we can find in society and that a lot of people adopt. For instance, fashion trends or being vaccinated, the fact of smoking, or sharing some contents on online social network. And we realize that those propagations just like propagate in the society and we end up to all, uh, not all, but a large majority of the population begin to behave the same because people are influencing each other. And we are influenced by our friends, also by our family, etc. So how do we model a contagion? So let's start with the example of the yellow jacket in France. It's a political movement that happened in France in uh, 2018. It's an anti-political, uh, anti-governmental movement, and people were joining this movement movements by wearing this yellow jacket that you can see on the pictures. So we represent the society uh, as a network and every node can have two states. Either they are susceptible, they haven't joined yet the movement or they are infected that they have joined the movement. So the movement starts with one person who hasn't been influenced by anyone because it just joined by itself. Uh, we call that a spontaneous adoption. And then this person might influence its friends and maybe some of their friends will decide to join the movement. And those people will also influence their neighbors and et cetera, and it propagates like this in the network. In our case of study, the only transition allowed is from the susceptible to the infected states. Once we are in the infected state, we stay there and there is no possibility to change. Um, and there exist two main ways to model uh, an adoption process. The first one is called the simple contagion. It has been first um, used, so it's here on the left side. It has been first used to model epidemiology and the, the transmission of diseases, but also later it has been used um, to model the propagation of social network, of so, um, social behaviors. So let's say we have a susceptible node and it has a contact with an infected node. The susceptible node will become infected with a certain probability that we hear um we write it as beta so it's a probabilistic model the second way to model a contagion is the complex contagion so this contagion uh, rely on social reinforcement it's a deterministic process and uh, when we have like a susceptible node uh, its proportion of infected neighbors must be above a certain threshold to be infected this threshold we note it as phi so those are the two main processes uh, with the parameter beta and phi. On top of those two processes, we can add a third one, which, co which, which is called the spontaneous adoption. Um, this helps us to model when someone adopts a behavior, regardless the network, but more by looking, for instance, the advertisements or on internet or being influenced by other sources of influence by, by, by the network. So basically, a susceptible node has a probability, a certain probability that we note R to be infected at every time step, regardless the state of its neighbors. Um, when we have a propagation, uh, the question of trying to know if this propagation uh, rely uh, like is uh, is caused by the simple, the complex, or the spontaneous adoption has already been tackled by different papers that you can see here. But in these studies, um, they assume that every node in get infected the same way. So every node gets infected either by the simple contagion or every node gets infected by the complex contagion, and they try to differentiate between this um, propagation. However, in some studies, it has been shown that um, in some propagations, 
some nodes, for instance, will be infected by the simple contagion, while some nodes will be infected by the complex contagion and others by the spontaneous adoption. Um, this depends on our personality and depends on how close we are with people who are influencing us and also by the behavior itself. It depends on a lot of things. And in that case, we cannot apply the, the former studies that we have seen. So in that case, when like everyone uh, gets infected in a different way, we can ask how to distinguish between the simple, the complex and the spontaneous adoptions. And we, we can do it um, in two levels. The first one at the local levels, meaning that we take a node and we look at the time of its contagion and the contagion patterns and the infection of its neighbors. And we can try to classify it between the simple, the complex and the spontaneous adoption. We can also do it at the global level. At that time, we cannot say uh, this contagion is simple because it's a mixture of different uh, contagion processes. But we can say that this contagion is dominated by the simple contagion or is dominated by the complex contagion. So this is basically the, other, the agenda of today. First, we will see uh, how to classify it at the local level and then at the global level. So first, let's see at the local level. So our problem is a classification process um, between the simple, the complex, and the spontaneous adoption. So we are working in a parameter space um, composed of, we vary the parameter beta and the parameter phi. So remember, beta is a parameter of the simple contagion, and it's the probability to be infected uh, when we have a contact with an infected node. So when beta is high, it means that the probability to be infected is high. So it means that the propagation by simple contagion will be um, fast. So here we have a fast, simple contagion. And when phi is low, it means that the threshold to be infected by the complex contagion is low. It means that we will easily be infected by the complex contagion. So it means that also when phi is low, the complex contagion is uh, fast. So I would like you to remember that when beta is high and phi is low, so in this top left corner, the simple and the complex contagions are both fast here. Yeah. And to distinguish between the processes, we will use two main methods. First, we will use a likelihood. Basically, when we'll have a contagion case, we will uh, calculate the likelihood that this contagion case has been infected by the simple contagion or by the complex contagion or by the spontaneous adoption. And we will take the maximum of those values. And this will give us a classification. Also, in some cases, uh, I will show you later, we can also uh, theoretically calculate the accuracies of the classification. The second big method that we are using is a machine learning method, meaning that we will train random forests to solve our task. Uh, we have identified eight features um, that we are using in the machine learning, so which are the degree, the number of infected neighbors at the moment of the contagion, the proportion of infected neighbors. Also, like when we look at the ego, like every neighbors, every infected neighbors will send stimuli and try to infect the ego at every time step. So this will give us a list of stimuli received by the neighbors, by the ego, by each neighbor. So we can do the sum of it. So this will give us the sum of stimuli and we can divide this sum by the degree. So the number of stimuli by neighbors, we can take the standard deviation. And the two last features that we are using is the time from the first infected neighbors to the contagion of the ego and the time from the last infected neighbors to the infection of the ego. So having those two methods, we can conduct some experiment and to see if it works. And first, we want to conduct this experiment on synthetic networks because um, we don't have grand truth uh, on real data. So we want to know if those methods will work on synthetic networks. So we conduct different experiments uh, from a very easy and um, setting to a much more complex one. So let's, take, let's, let, let's start with experiment one here uh, on the left. So what we do is we generate star networks. 
So we don't take a whole connected network, but just ego network individually. So the ego node and its neighbors. And we infect the neighbors randomly. And at some points, the ego network that we have assigned beforehand a, a, pro, a contagion process and a parameter will get infected. And this will be um, our problem that to classify this node. Um, at the beginning, I said it will be very easy. We will uh, say that beta, phi, and r, so the three parameters of the contagion, are known. So we are really in an easy setting at the beginning. And we we look at the we use the likelihood method on this classification. So here you can see the results of the accuracies of the classification in our parameter space phi and beta. So you can see that it's pretty great accuracies because if we have a random classifier, uh, the if we have a random classifier, we will obtain accuracies of 0 0.33. So all of them are much above 0 0.33 and even close to one. But this corner, this corner, we don't have good accuracy. And remember, in the phase space, it's when we have the simple and the complex contagions, which are both fast, meaning that in this case, the node uh, has the same pattern of infection with the simple and the complex contagion. Like if I have an infected neighbors, I have a high probability that I will get infected straight after because my beta is very high or my phi is very low. So basically, when we try to differentiate with those uh, two kinds of contagions, it's very hard because they have really the same patterns. And um, here in that case, in that experiment, um, we are also able to theoretically uh, calculate the expected accuracy that we could get. And we can see that um, we get a um, very similar value that what we should get, what we get with the simulation. So this is cool. This is cool, but we want to go a bit, something a bit more complicated because this is an easy setting. So I will talk about experiment two and three. So in that case, we just take a whole network, a synthetic network, a nerdor training network. And beforehand, we assign to every node a contagion process and a parameter. And, um, and then we launch the propagation. And then we collect all the contagion cases and we study them. So in the middle column, uh, we assume that beta, phi, and r are known. So this is still an easy case. But then in experiment three, we assume that beta, phi, and r are not known. So it's a little bit harder. So let's. So we conduct it with a likelihood, which is the first row. The results are the first row. And also with the machine learning, with, which the results are the second row here. So we can see that um, first, this corner that we was hard to distinguish is still the weak point of our phase space. Um, it's always hard to distinguish when beta is high and phi is low. Um, so when beta, phi, and r are known, when the parameter we are in this case and the parameters are still known, um, we still get good accuracies, but we can see that uh, the likelihood um, have a mean of accuracy of 0 0.87, uh, which is much better than the uh, machine learning. I mean, which is better than the machine learning. And this is, um, and uh, this makes sense because the likelihood is kind of a baseline and the machine learning should not perform as good as a likelihood. But when we go to experiment three here, we can see that in that case, the likelihood has a mean of 0 0.69 while the machine learning performs better with a mean on 0 0.73. It's due to the fact that here, the parameters are not known. So we have to infer them. And as we infer the parameters, we cannot be as accurate with the likelihood that we were before. And then in that case, the machine learning works better. So in that point of our, uh, our research, we were super happy and we were like, okay, we found two methods. Now we can go to real data. So that's what we did. We went to real data. We took um, the propagation of hashtags on Twitter. Um, so basically, um, we look at users posting a certain hashtag on Twitter and uh, and who of the person 
uh, of this person follows posted also the hashtags and we collect all those data and then we run our two methods. So basically we had the infection of the ego and the infection of the, um, the neighbors and we can just compute our data, our methods. Um, so we use the hashtag yellow jacket. That's why I was talking about yellow jacket before. And this is the result that we obtained. So in all our contagion cases, when you, we use a, a likelihood, we get a lot of spontaneous. While when we uh, use the likelihood, we get a lot of simple contagion. So those results showed a very big bias and uh, we were very surprised first, but then we dig a little bit more in the results. And we discover that our big problem here with the real data was called the waiting time. So the waiting time is the following. In real data, when I get convinced by an idea, for instance, the yellow jacket idea, it will take me time to really make a tweet about it. So basically, there is a time between the moment I get infected and the moment we can observe my infection. While in the synthetic data, it was not at all the case. When I was getting infected, I could be observed straight away. So this was a very big problem, and this waiting time was causing this bias in our data. So um, what we did is we conduct a fourth experiment. So the fourth experiment is a synthetic data set still, which we wanted to be as close as possible as a Twitter. And in this uh, data set, we introduce a waiting time. And with this waiting time, um, we could be as close as possible as a real data, and um, which was great. And we wanted to, so we we wanted to classify our instances from this data set. So we couldn't use a likelihood method because this this was too complicated. This setup was too complicated. But we use the machine learning, and we still get quite good accuracies. So thanks to this data set, which is very close to the real Twitter data set. Um, we we have this model that we train this um, random forest that we can use now to classify our true instances with the hashtag of the yellow jacket. So that's what we did, and we and we observe the following. So those are the classification. It's a bit of big figures, but basically we are still in the parameter space phi and beta, with phi and beta the inferred parameter of the data set, and. Um, this D that you can see is a decil of um, the different decil of the whole range of phi. So, um, and here are the decil of the parameters of beta. So you can see the classification between the simple, the complex, and the spontaneous across the whole phase space for the real propagation. So simple uh, is shown in purple, complex in orange, and spontaneous in uh, gray. First, we can see that in total, we have a bit more simple than complex and then a bit less than spontaneous. And we can see that our methods here uh, classify uh, majoritarily uh, a simple contagion if the proportion of infected neighbors is high and if the sum of stimuli is low here in this part. And also it classified it as complex uh, if um, the sum of stimuli uh, is low and we don't have a lot of uh, infected neighbors. Also, it classified only as simple contagion, uh, spontaneous adoption, sorry, here that you can see, if uh, there is no stimuli and no infected neighbors. So this is part of a study that I'm doing with uh, Gergely Odor, Jacopo Jacopini and Martin Karsai. And we are now writing the preprint and it will come soon. So with the last study, we try to answer the question about the local level, but we haven't addressed the question about the global level. Remember, we want to distinguish between the simple, the complex, and the spontaneous adoption. So now let's see a bit what is happening at the global level. So let me explain a little bit what I mean. So we started with the hypothesis that we are both simple and complex. So I will explain you a little bit better. So let's take one node with all its connections, friends, family, acquaintances, etc. 
This person has close friends, maybe best friends, parents, siblings, etc. So this person, um, we are more likely to trust them. So we are more likely to be maybe infected through them by the simple contagion because they have a, they have a big power on us and they can make us change our, our minds. But we have also like acquaintances that we don't see a lot. For instance, our dentist that we see like once a year or something like this. Those persons will not influence as much as our close friends and maybe will contaminate us by the complex contagion. So basically, we assume that every person can be infected either by the simple or the complex contagions at the same time. And um, so our question, which is the same since the beginning, is when does the simple or the complex contagion dominate the propagation? So the way that we have found to solve these issues is to create a model to better understand how it works. So here is a, how the model um, works. Uh, it's a bit inspired by the activity-driven model of uh, Nicola Perra. So here are our nodes. We take n nodes. Um, to each node, we give us an activity, them an activity. The activity is a number between zero and one, um, which is a way to assess how active the node will be in the network. So, how how much you will be likely to make connections in the network. So some nodes are infected. I denote it here infection by the yellow jacket. And to every time step, here is how it will go. So we select a random node and we activate the node with the probability of its activity. So if it's uh, active, we keep it, otherwise we do nothing. And we keep it also only if it's susceptible. Then if it's active and susceptible, we connect the node to M or the random network that we, we take as random. And then with the probability P, we infect this green node. Oh, oh, no, sorry, with the probability P, we check if the, the M neighbors can infect the node with the simple contagion. So P is the probability that we check for the simple contagion. If it's the case, we infect the node. Otherwise, we do nothing. And otherwise, if we don't check for the simple contagion, we check for the complex contagion. So if uh, the condition is fulfilled to be infected by the complex contagion, we infect it. Otherwise, we do nothing. So basically, here are all our parameters. And we will mainly study the influence of the parameter P and the parameter beta. Um, so this model can be put in theory. Um, this is like the beginning of the study, the theoretical study. So we say that the number of infected nodes at t plus delta t having a certain activity A is equal to the number of nodes having the same activity at the time before, plus here the probability to have a susceptible node, here times the probability that the node is active, times the probability the node is infected, meaning P times the probability it's infected by the simple, plus one minus P, the node probability the node is infected by the complex. So this is a bit hard to study like this. So we have to, we have to do hypothesis. First, we do the hypothesis that we are at the beginning of the propagation. So rho, rho being here, the number, the proportion of infected neighbors, uh, uh, infected nodes, sorry. Rho being the proportion of infected nodes is very small. And also we assume that every node has the same activity. And we conduct the, sim the simulation. So here you can see um, the simulation and the contagion curves that we observe. So here we vary beta on the x-axis and we vary p on the y-axis. And we can see here the number of infected nodes through time. The first thing that we can see here is that uh, in some settings, some propagations are very slow. For instance, here, when P is high, meaning that we'll check a lot of simple contagion, but beta is low, meaning that we'll check a lot of simple contagion, but we'll not succeed to infect the nodes because beta is too low. The contagion will be very slow compared to other settings. For instance, when beta is high and P is high, so we check a lot of simple contagion, but we succeed to infect the nodes because P is high. We have so fast, um, fast, um, 
uh, evolu um, e um, propagations. So by solving this equation on the top, we, op we obtain this solution. And this solution diverges for a certain time. And this time is supposed to be the time. So when the number of infected nodes begins to increase a lot. And this time is indicated here by this dash line here. And we can see that it works pretty good because when we have the dash line, we have this big increase at the beginning of the propagation. But this is cool, but what we want to do is to classify between the simple and the complex contagion, right? And we can already make some hypotheses. So for instance, when P is high and beta is high, meaning that we check a lot of simple contagion and we succeed to infect the node, we expect to have a lot of simple contagion, right? And we can see that the curves looks like quite a simple contagion curve. But when B, P is low and beta is low, meaning that we check a lot for the simple of the complex contagion. So we want to, we try to infect a lot by the complex contagion and beta is low. So even if we check for the simple contagion, we will not succeed very well to infect the nodes. We expect a, a lot of complex contagion. And what we can see is that the curves here is very typical of a complex contagion because it's really reflecting the uh, cascade phenomena when a lot of nodes are suddenly infected. So not a lot of uh, is happening and then suddenly a, a large proportion of the nodes is infected. So we have some hypotheses that here it will be a lot of simple, here it will be a lot of complex, but we should check it. So what we do here, we are still in the beta P phase space. We plot the proportion of infected nodes infected by the simple contagion here in green, uh, purple, uh, the, compare the complex contagion in purple and the seed, which are the in, in infected nodes at the beginning of the propagation in orange. And so the, the curves sum to one. And we can see that here we were supposing, we were expecting a lot of simple contagion and we have a lot of simple contagion. And here we were expecting a lot of complex contagion and we have a lot of complex contagion. So to quantify this, we were thinking to look at, um, at the beginning of the propagation. So the beginning of the propagation is a gray area here indicated. Um, we were thinking about looking at the derivative of the purple curves versus the green curves. So basically, um, if so, which is basically this, we will compute which is a ratio between the slope of the simple versus the slope of the complex. So if this is higher than one, for instance here, it means that at the beginning we have the slope of the simple is very high, meaning that uh, we have a lot of simple uh, contagion. While if it's lower than one, it's the opposite and we have a lot of complex contagion. And this is what we get here. So here is a phase space where with much more values for beta and P. And we can see that in this area, uh, the slope of simple versus the slope of complex is uh, higher than one, and we have a lot of simple contagion. And here it's lower than one, and we have a lot of complex contagion. I will explain you later what is this uh, red line. So this is a nice method to try to differentiate between the simple and the complex contagion, but we wanted to try to um, find new methods to see if it was really the case, if this delimitation was here, or it was just like this method which was giving this result. So what we realize is that if we have only the simple contagion, uh, we have this equation. And this is great because if we take the, uh, the inverse of this quantity, we are supposed to have a linear decreasing function. So if we have a lot of complex and we take the inverse of this, this will give us a linear decreasing function. And this is what, so this is here, the brown plot here. And we can see that when we have a lot of complex, actually we have this linear decrease that we were expecting that we don't get when we have um, the simple contagion. So what we do is that we take still the beginning of the propagation in, gr in gray and we fit a line um, with the data of the beginning of the propagation. And then, so we have our simulation here in brown and our fit here in dash line. 
And then we look at when the simulation and the fit diverges of a certain epsilon. And then when they diverges too much, we draw this uh, red line. So it gives us a certain time. And we look at the proportion of uh, infected neighbors at that time. And then we plot it in the parameter space. And we can see really like um, if, um, if the, it's very linear, it means that it will be linear for a long time. So until a row is quite high. And we can see that this is exactly the pattern of the simple, the complex contagion here in this corner again. And here we have again the simple contagion. So, and we can, if we look at those two figures, we can see that the delimitation here is quite at the same location. Um, so now it's time for me to explain what is this red line that I plotted on the top. So if I look at the uh, equation of evolution of rho, we have this. But the term in rho plus a term in rho square. The term in rho comes only from the conta simple contagion. But the term in rho square comes from the simple and the complex contagion. So what we were thinking to do is to uh, try to compare those two terms and to try to solve when this row will be, when which row will give us that the equivalence between the simple and the complex, uh, the, the two terms. So when the simple will be equivalent with the simple and the complex. And so this give us a row. And um, we look at in our simulation at which time we 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 reach this row and if this time is equal to zero it means that we don't have at all simple but we have seen the beginning complex but if this time is it's not null it means that at the beginning the propagation is governed by the comp the simple one and then we 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 show in the figures oops sorry we show here in the figures this delimitation of um, of uh, the time when the term in rho is equivalent to the term in rho square. And we can see that it's also still at the delimitation of um, our simple and complex areas. So this is great, but let's say we have a contagion curve and we want to know if it's dominated by the simple or the complex contagion. Um, so it's we cannot use those methods because those methods rely on the parameters of the model, and we don't know the parameters of the model. So the method that we have found is the following. First, we take a contagion curve so that we don't know anything about it, and we plot one over rho to the power m phi minus one for different values of m phi that we don't know, but we just try different values of m phi. So this will be co correspond to this method. And we keep the most linear curve. And then we classify with this curve, we classify it as complex if the linearity is above a certain threshold. So this is a way to giving a contagion curve to know if it's dominated by the simple or the complex. And here are the results. So um, we are still in the parameter space beta and p. And here the red lines are the red lines that we plotted before. So it's a delimitation between simple and complex, the one that we know, the truth. And here, uh, when it's classified as complex, I color it in yellow. And when it's classified as simple, I color it in blue. And uh, we can see that when M5 is equal to two, we, we are doing good in the classification between simple and complex. But here, when M5 is equal to three, um, we have this area, which is a bit, which is not great in the classification, but which is still small. But we don't, we cannot, I think, I don't think so. We can just, uh, we can um, correct this area. We have to deal with this. So this is a um, work that I'm doing with Martin Carsai, Romualdo Pastor Satora, and Michele Sternini. And also, we are also writing the article now. Um, to conclude, I would like to say that our goal was to classify between the simple and the complex contagion. At the local level, we are 
doing good classification unless both propagations are fast. And we lose accuracies when we complexify the propagation processes. And at the, local, uh, the, at the global level, we are able to classify it, uh, only with the contagion curves. So thanks a lot for listening. It was great to talk with you today. And I will be very happy to have some comments, uh, suggestions, or like questions from you. Thank you. It was a very interesting talk. So I, I kind of have heard the first part, but the second part was really interesting. And we also worked on a project that we have shown under some conditions, depending on the network structure, you can kind of say a simple contagion process can be even approximated with the complex contagion one. Now I was thinking the whole time about your parameter space. And mm -hmm. so I have two questions personally, like, uh, so if I got it right, you only investigate SI processes, right? Yes. And systems. And uh, all the networks that you were discussing, they were like three life networks, like you were going through early training and even simpler structures. Yeah, so, um, so um, in the first project, yes, so we investigated on other training. But we also tried different type of network. We tried um, Barabashi Albert. We tried a stochastic block model, and um, we tried also on a real Twitter, a, tw a mansion Twitter network. And we realized that we get very very similar accuracies. Mm -hmm. So we kept Albert Schreiner. Mm -hmm. um, and also when I can, oops, ah, this is oh. And also in the fourth experiment, um, oops, in the fourth experiment here that we wanted a data set which was very close to a Twitter data set, we have an underlying network which is a, a following network on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And in the second project is the activity driven model. So every time I connect to every time step, I connect to M network, uh, M nodes which are randomly taken. So there is no structure um, underlying. Okay, okay, cool. Other questions? Oh, I wanted to ask about, uh, so what exactly do you need for this? Uh, like for uh, estimating for a single node, like you do here, if the infection is uh, simple or complex or Spontaneous. You need to know the like the time. Yeah. So I need to know um the time of uh I need to know um the time of infection of the neighbors and the time of infection of uh the ego node. I mean I don't need to know exactly at what time is it, but the time differences between the egg the infection of the neighbors and the infection of the ego node. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, I also need to know the, I mean, I need to know the friends, like the total ego network yeah. to, um, yeah. Okay, right. We wanted to try to assume that we have no knowledge from the whole process, because sometimes like it's hard to get information of the whole process of a whole contagion process. So we were trying really to limit ourselves of, um, yeah, only the local information that we can get. Even though in some experiment we, use the parameters of the infection, but yeah. But in the global case, in the last slide, you said that there you only need the curve, like. Yeah, that's... in that case, we I, I only need the contagion curve, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Also Thank here, you. when you estimate, like, isn't it kind of same, uh, or maybe not the global thing, but here you, you first estimate these parameters, at least if you use the likelihood approach yeah kind of uh, uh i mean then you maybe you have to as assume that these are like similar to other people or something but you can get some some kind of global picture by estimating these parameters yeah something. yeah it's true um like I can get a global picture because we we think that R, like the probability of being infected by the spontaneous uh, contagion, is constant for the whole network. 
but we we said that for the parameter beta and phi, this changes through no, from nodes to nodes. So beta and phi are not like global parameters, but they change from nodes to nodes. Mm -hmm. But we can, so it's a way to assess also the distribution of beta and phi that we can find in the network. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Nice. <laughs> yeah. No more questions? Uh, I'm not sure if a question, but thinking about this, uh, the effect of network structure on this, and I'm kind of thinking that probably here, SI and SIR would be very different, right? So for especially for how easy it is for complex contagion to spread. So what I'm thinking about is that if you have a ton of triangles in your network, then yeah. what will more easily happen is that many of your neighbors will be infected roughly simultaneously because there are so many direct pathways between your neighbors. And therefore, something that has a lot of triangles would favor complex contagion as opposed to something that is just a tree. But that is probably so for SIR or something where you need to have sort of the timing of the infections to be roughly in the same ballpark, uh, probably not so for SI, except maybe in the very beginning, because then you will have infected nodes all over the place. So I'm kind of thinking that it might be an interesting question to still look at under some conditions, look into the network structure. So whether it's very, very clustered or not, that might play a yeah. role. Yeah, I see what you mean. So. Uh, I like the way we did, I think is a bit limiting this effect because beforehand we assigned to each node a contagion process and this node can be infected only by the simple or the complex contagion. So if there is a lot of triangles, it doesn't mean that we will have a lot of complex contagion um, because, uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, node is already assigned, assigned simple. So it, we will weigh that the simple contagions. But I think they are different way to do and it would be interesting to also like not a sign beforehand and see a little bit with the network structure, the differences, it will be great, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we have this paper on contact tracing. So basically you have two types of dynamics at the same time. One is like that the SIR process is unfolding and at the same time, there is this loop of feedback that you put people in quarantine. And then depending okay. on how dense your local structure is, then you have this competing mechanism which go back and forth in like triangles or loops. So you can basically even say that a simple contagion can be approximated in a way that the probability of infection is now like a reinforcement mechanism because it's not only about like a state of I, like S to I, it's also about something which is a bit time delayed. So it can always like get back to it and you can reduce hmm. beta as a function of basically phi or like your threshold thing. And uh, it, it, for us, it was also a very fun discovery that if, cool, the, yeah. if the network is like very dense, it is has a lot of clicks, then when you have uh, dynamics which have this competing mechanism, they can be modeled differently depending on uh, how you want to interpret it. But I also have some question, like even given this framework, if I give you some data set, uh, how easy you can say that, uh, like let's say we have some observation from some real phenomena and I ask you, like what you have shown here, uh, what was the influence of random, like that spontaneous interaction thing? Because this is spontaneous interaction is like very similar to this external field when you have like on a magnetic system, right? So you can yes. always uh, kind of tune R in a way that it it ruins everything or it wins everything, right? So like yeah, R can yeah. be influence of foreign media and then you can have your beta and phi parameters. So let's say for the next social crisis in Paris, can you say, was it like something uh, spontaneous or something emerged from people? Um, I think we can only um, classify it now if it's, we can we observe it from an online social network point of view. 
because uh, we train our model on this experiment, which is very, um, we, tr we try to really like try to reproduce Twitter as much as we could uh, with synthetic data. So as long as it's synthetic, we can use our model. Uh, as long as it's an online social network, we can use our model. And as long as it's about posting, and uh, that should be fine, and we could do some uh, estimation. But if it's a real propagation, I think we should redefine an experiment which would be matching a little bit more like the contagion process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I see. Yeah. Great. Yes. Yes. Um, so in this case, you are interested in like classifying uh, these spontaneous, simple, and complex mutations, right? Different yes. mutation process. But I was wondering if there is like a way to kind of unify this uh, these contagion processes. Like, so is for example, is simple contagion or spontaneous contagion can it be formulated as a special case of complex contagion? Like, so basically, like uh, in, intuitively speaking, you need some people need zero people, zero neighbors to be activated themselves. Some people need mm. one person. Some people need ten people around them to be activated themselves. So, so I think I, I'm not sure how you like formulate this, but if you think of this situation, then it's more about the distribution of the like like the in the population, like how people behave, right? Yeah, that's true. It's a uh, it's a big matter also of definition. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, for instance, if I have like a contagion case and I just need one neighbor to be infected, so it's like a simple contagion with a probability a beta equal one, mm -hmm. right? So here we we didn't um, we we didn't think like this. We were just thinking like if the cause is the complex contagion, so it's if it's about a threshold we classify it as complex contagion. If it's yeah. about a probability, we classify it as simple contagion. Mm -hmm. That's how we, we saw the problem. But yeah. I guess that's true. There are, there are different ways to see it. And maybe like by regrouping, we could have also different results and maybe even better. I don't know. We should try, I guess. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Any other questions, people online, people offline? Okay, let's thank you all again. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting and for the nice discussion. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, very nice talk. <laughs> Have a nice summer and hope to see you soon. Yeah, thanks a lot. Have a nice.